What's up, gang? Welcome to The Greatness Machine. I'm your host, Darius from Shaw's Day. I'm so pumped to have you here with me. Now listen, The Greatness Machine, we're about two things. Number one, people who live in their passions. And number two, those who are creating greatness in the world and doing both of these things despite the odds against them. Each episode, we're going to feature interviews with game changers, business leaders, you know, telling us their origin stories, what made them tick, what got them to where they are now. Why? So it can help you step into your greatness within your life, your business, and your career. Occasionally, you might hear a few solo episodes from myself, moi, as I say, as I leverage my 20 years of entrepreneurship as a CEO and founder to help you grow and level up in your journey to scale your life and your business. So come be a fly on the wall, enjoy the conversation, and I'm stoked to have you here with me. Guys, welcome to today's episode of The Greatest Machine. I'm your host, Darius from Shazam. Boy, do we have a special guest. I am so excited that we have Sarah Edmondson here. Sarah, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Darius. It's a total treat. Oh, my gosh. So um, if you don't mind, I'm going to do a little bit of housekeeping here. Um, the, the Greatest Machine, we're about, oh, yeah, The Greatest Machine, we're about two things. We're about people who are living their passions and those are, that are creating greatness in the world and doing so despite the odds. And we're going to be talking to Sarah today about all these amazing things that she's working on. Most notably, though, we're going to be talking about how she took down Nexium, this, this cult up in upstate New York. It was a worldwide uh, organization that she took down, became front page news in the New York Times. There's a show on HBO about it. I am so, so pumped to have you here and to talk about all the greatness you've, you've created in the world. So welcome and uh, let's, let's, let's do this. Let's do it. <laughs> so um i know um you know we we, we were uh, talking earlier and you're like oh man like there's always business people on the show and and I, mm -hmm. i'll say this that i i do i'm a kind of a multifaceted person and whenever i people have an interesting story i just feel like there's so much to be learned and and you have man i, I really i mean listening to your book and seeing the show you really are a, like a profound person and the fact that you had the courage to do what you did with Nexium. That, that was really one of the main reasons I, I wanted you on the show. And, and I had this opportunity where a mutual friend of ours, Cameron Harold, hit me up. He's like, hey, Darius, you want to interview Sarah? And I was like, fuck yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Cameron. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cam, Cam Cameron. is the... I love him he too. He's, he's, he's a good, good buddy. And I was, I was really into it. And, and even to your point, it's, it's like a lot of people, a lot of our listeners are business people. People are people. And I think there's so many, so much lessons to be learned about, you know, courage and stepping up and doing tough things. And I think that that can be applied to any part of life. So, um, Absolutely. yeah. And also I feel so, like yeah, that, that's, that's, that's really why I wanted you on the show. Oh, thanks for, thanks for having me. Well, I, at first I was like, oh, this is more, you know, sales and business oriented. But when I looked a little closer, I definitely saw, like I always, I always watch podcasts or listen to podcasts before I go on just to get a sense of tone and vibe and think about what in my experience might be helpful nuggets for the, for what seems to be the audience. And I, uh, I saw a lot right away and um, depending on what questions you ask me, um, just in terms of like my journey and what even got me into Nexium in the first place in terms of being a seeker and a, an advocate for um, growth and being, you know, wanting to be on the growth path and going into personal development and things like that. So I, I've learned a lot and I, I hope to, to share some of the wisdom from the crazy part of my life with your audience and give them the nuggets without having to join a cult. Yeah, no, I mean, I mean, that, that, that's the goal, right? Get the mm -hmm. nuggets. Don't, don't, don't join, join the cult. <laughs> it depends on the cult. You know, it's, mm -hmm. there's probably some, some decent ones out there where you might want to join them. But, um, <laughs> if you don't mind, I'd love to give your, your formal bio. Is that cool? And sure, then we can yeah. uh, jump into some, Please. the show. So, so look for listeners who are maybe not necessarily familiar with, with Sarah and her story. She, uh, Sarah is an actor, voice actor, producer, author, and podcast host. Um, notably, you know, we're going to be talking a lot about your, her involvement. She was, uh, really moved up the ranks and became highly involved in the Nexium organization, ended up becoming the whistleblower, taking them down. And we were, we were talking about it a little bit before the show. I was like, you know, that takes fucking courage to step up and go against your friends and your community and do the right thing when you see wrong, like wrongful things happening around you. So me talking about that, uh, notably for people that are familiar with the story or not, uh, there's a HBO docu documentary, two part uh, docu series called the vow, which is where I became familiar with the story. Um, she also wrote a uh, award-winning book, uh, Scarred, which everyone needs to go get and listen to. And, um, and we're going to be talking about your, your podcast, A Little Bit Culty, which is getting a ton of uh, acclaim and a ton of, 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 of uh, attention these days. So, so excited to have you here. 
and um, and to get to talk about all these amazing things you've been doing. Um, awesome. If you don't, Sarah, if you don't mind, I'd love if you could um, kind of give us some of your origin story. You know, sure. a big part of greatness is where people's stories and where they came from. If you don't mind, like, kind of give us a little bit of your origin story. Absolutely. And before you do, there, uh, thank you for that bio. Um, uh, it's very kind of you. The only thing I have to correct is that my book is not award-winning yet. Maybe you're just future casting and there's going to be an award in the future. But um, so far, it's just doing its thing out there in oh, the world. I, I, and... I, I, uh, yeah, I, I forgot to tell you I'm a time traveler and that's yes. happening in about 18 months. Just I up. really appreciate that. And when, when it happens, <laughs> I'll be sure to shout out to the greatest machine. Um <laughs> So my, my backstory is I'm from Canada, born and raised in Vancouver. Um, I'm the child of uh, parents who were in the, my mom's a family therapist. My dad's a now retired school counselor. Both of them were very much um, politically and socially active. They always taught me, ironically, you know, to leave the world better than it, than when you, when you found it and to make a difference in the world. I had big, bold dreams of wanting to have an impact. That's always just something that's been part of my value set. I think that my goal, uh, it, when I like left high school is that I'd become an actor and then I'd become, you know, famous enough to have a voice and like have causes and somewhere along the, those lines, I imagined being, um, I don't always get into this in interviews, but given what you just asked me, I thought I, I wanted to help. Like I'd been bullied in high school and, you know, had a, did, you know, was not one of the popular kids. And I thought maybe I could help young women. And I didn't really have like a particular message or, um, you know, angle, just wanting to like be an advocate or have a cause, like just, it was a very loose concept. Either way, I knew I wanted to, to have, to have an impact. And then I got into acting thinking that would be the thing that, and that ended up not being the thing because it was not, I didn't find it particularly meaningful. I did work as an actor and never got famous, but also felt like I was working, but it was also not fulfilling. It was, it didn't fill that you know, search for meaning that I always had. And, uh, around that time, I was also getting into personal development. I was reading the books like the artist's way, um, Celestine prophecy, thinking real rich, attending s seminars, probably many of the same seminars that you probably have heard of. And in that time was also, it was like the early two thousands was when, what the bleep came out with the bleep do we know? And my boyfriend at the time who's a filmmaker still is very talented. Um, got accepted into a film festival where the director of the bleep was speaking. So I was on this like kind of semi-spiritual personal development journey, trying to find, you know, meaning in my life is also really craving community. Being an actor is kind of a lonely, a lonely place, unless you're like in a cool theater troupe, which I wasn't. And we ended up at this film festival and I met the director of what the bleep and his whole thing was, and especially with, with the movie, which I'm not, not necessarily an advocate for now because my sort of beliefs are out of change. But at the time I thought, wow, this movie, this little independent film shifted consciousness. And I want to be a part of media that shifts consciousness. So when I met Mark and he told me about this community that was like-minded humanitarians changing the world. And there was a seminar that was created by one of the smartest men in the world. He was a humanitarian and he was um, creating this conscious community. I was like, I'm in. And I didn't Google it or, or anything. I just jumped in. I trusted Mark and it just happened that there was a, a training a few weeks later. And if you saw the vow, I, I, you know, I get into this and I get go into much more detail in my book, but the long and short of it is that I was totally, I was skeptical at first, a lot of red flags that I over, I overrode my instinct on for a number of reasons, which I'm happy to get into later if you want. But ultimately I stayed in my level of uh, commitment and loyalty and allegiance grew over time. I eventually stayed for 12 years. Lots of things happened in that time. Of, I don't know how much detail you want in that 12 years, but eventually uh, I woke up, like what I call waking up, um, snapped out of the indoctrination, which took many, many years to complete. And once I, w once I was awake and saw what was really going on, which was this personal development program, which I had loved and this community that I loved was like a it's like a front for some very dark, nefarious things that were happening behind closed doors, which I was not aware of. And uh, while I do appreciate you saying, you know, I took it down, I didn't take it down a lot by myself. There was a group of others, uh, whistleblowers, and, and their stories are out there also. And together we worked to expose the truth, uh, initially through law enforcement. They didn't know what they were looking at. Uh, then through the media, and the media got the attention of 
the FBI. And the rest is history. The leader is now, uh, the, the trial happened very quickly. He w- he flew to Mexico. They found him there and uh, eventually convicted him of uh, seven different counts and sentenced him for 120 years in jail and five years probation. So yeah. that's the, that's the sh- short version of my story. And here we are. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's an amazing, like four minute version of, of a much bigger story. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's, I just said 18 years condensed because I, I was there for 12 years and then I've been out for almost six. I'll be out for six this May. So, um, yeah. So, uh, you know, so I'd love to kind of go to the, the beginning part because, you know, the, the, some of the things that stood out to me and especially in your book was it seemed like you, <laughs> to your point earlier that you were lo- really looking for like this purpose, right. And, and trying to, to find purpose. And, and you were 28 years old trying to find purpose in your life and then found this group that, you know, that in, you had said in the book as, you know, your people that you consider, wow, these could be my people. Yeah. Um, what do you like, you know, for, for people out there. And I think it's interesting is that we as humans are tribal, like that's, we're mm-hmm. all like, I think from a DNA perspective, looking for that, cause that's just how we survive the saber tooth tigers, you know, mm-hmm. 20,000, 30,000, hundred thousand years ago. Mm-hmm. So what do you think? Like, what, what was it about this group that really got you, you know, attracted to them? What was it that really like got you wanting to be a part of them? Because obviously later on you, you figured out different, but early on, what was it that really drew you in? I think that there was a couple of things. One is it felt very supportive and that's something that I've always looked for in my life. And to, to be surrounded by people who were all working towards, you know, bettering themselves and bettering the world and having like this collective mission felt really good. I've since learned that, you know, in, in, I'm going to say high control groups uh, versus cult there's an us versus them mentality and a righteousness that we think that we're, what we're doing is better than everybody else. And it's the only way. And that, you know, that felt really good. It's like being part of a secret club. Um, so that was a big part of it also to feel like I really, even though I didn't ever get super close to Keith, I really respected Keith at the time, obviously not now. Um, and for what the, the tech that he claimed to have invented, which was basically a, you know, a culmination of a number of different modalities and seminars and, and workshops that he had had essentially stolen from, but he packaged it in a way that was really transformational. So if you took a five day training and you were open and you applied all the tools, it really was, like a full upgrade to the operating system is what was the, you know, computer, the shitty computer me- metaphor that we used. Sorry. Can I swear on this podcast? I forgot. Oh yeah. Fuck yeah. Okay. Say, say, fuck I, yes. I drop okay. F bombs. My favorite all word all the time. Same here. And to the point where my <laughs> three-year-old son just got in trouble for saying it at preschool, but <laughs> it's just life. It's got to learn it somewhere. Anyway. Exactly. Um, From sorry. Mama. Sorry. Everybody at the school. Anyway. Um, I did blame my husband for that. I was like, oh, it must be my husband. I don't know <laughs> why he swears so much. Um, I lost my train of thought. What was it? Uh, you're uh, talking. Yeah, I, I lost it too. Um, uh, no, you're we're- talking about, um, uh, I think about how, you know, he, you know, oh, took on respected. The, the computers. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So I, I, I did, I did feel like I had found the path, the answer. And after, even to the point where I said to my parents, like, you know, therapy, the things that you're doing with your clients, even though they've been to school and we're actually trained professionals, that's not going to get to the root cause of their people's issues. What we're doing does. And I felt it was like a cure all for any, any challenge that anyone could have in their life. And I'd seen evidence of that to a degree. So all those things combined and some really cool people. There's also a lot of people that like, I never would have been friends with otherwise had I not encountered this community some of whom were wonderful people, some of whom I don't miss at all, but we were kind of thrown together and the collective ego of our group was very powerful. Yeah. Um, that, that seemed pretty obvious from, and from anyone that's seen <laughs> yeah. the vow, you, you, you can obviously, and let me ask you a question just yeah. so I, I want to make sure I'm, I'm not being offensive. If I say high control group, is that like the, the, the correct way of calling it a cult? Or I mean, can I call it cult? You can call it a cult. I, it is just a word that I know polarizes 
people. And I'm always trying to think about if somebody's in something and they've been like, we were trained that people are going to call us a cult. And that makes sense because they don't understand what we're doing. And what a cult does is it, um, it, this, this is what we were told at the time, is that if someone is calling it a cult, is this a way to sort of discredit it without saying what's bad about it, right? And Which is true. If I say, oh, that's just a cult, people don't go, oh, it's just a cult, it's bad. But like, what specifically right. are they doing that's bad that makes it a cult? And there's lots of things that I've since learned, you know, abuses of power. There's certain tactics that a group does. Ultimately, it's a big lie. There's a bait and switch. Like, hey, come take this personal development program. And in 12 years, we're going to put the leader's initials on your you know, on your pelvis in a, with no anesthetic in a sisterhood ceremony. Like if I had known that's what I was getting into, I never would have said yes. Right. Right. So there's a lot of these groups are built on deception. And if you can say, if you can point those things out and there's a lot of other things I didn't get into, but it, it's a little bit more specific and more helpful than saying cult. It's, it's a good short for short, short. It's a good short form term for people to use. Um, but it's also can be sensationalized like, Oh, sex cult. Like that's good for getting the FBI involved, but not good for the people who were a part of it and don't want to be associated with a sex cult. And then they're really embarrassed because they are attached to this thing. That's really shameful. So I'm mindful of it as an advocate. You can say whatever you want. I'm that's part of why we have our podcast now is to, um, shine light on some of those things because we don't want people to join cults or groups that use uh, control or course of control. But if you use certain words that have been stigmatized or like attached to things like Jonestown, where it's like, don't, don't drink the Kool-Aid and people shaving heads and, um, you know, wearing white robes and chanting, if it doesn't look like that and what people think of as a cult, then they go, that's not a cult. It's just a personal development seminar. Yeah. Right. Well, so it, it, I'm a, it just sort of I'm a, breaks it down. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I'm a word warrior, so mm-hmm. um, I want to I want to use the right word. So I'm going to use yeah. my control group now. Sure. Um, uh, by the way, <laughs> there's there's something you said in the book that I like. I it's one of my favorite things. Tell me is is you talked about Keith, who was the yeah. head of the the group, uh, that he was a big on word salads, mm-hmm. <laughs> and and I'm like I call people out on that all the time. I, when I, I swear to God, I, I took notes and I capitalized that with four exclamation points. Word salad, lol. So tell us about his use of word salads. I'd love to hear about this. Yeah, this is something that I, I think is a big red flag now when when people tell me about their groups is is that these leaders like to use big words and and talk in these pontificating ways. To the point where, and the way Keith did it is he'd have these forums where he'd sit on these high chairs above everybody else, like a king, and everyone sit further down and we'd all look up at him and, and listen to him talk and ask questions like, how oh, Keith, like, you know, how, like, what is love and what is self-love or what's the nature of, I don't know, everything from global warming to uh, death, you know, like life questions. And he'd he'd answer. Right. And most of the time there'd be enough truth in it that I'd be like, wow, that's like probably really profound, but also maybe pulled from chicken soup for the soul. Um, and then <laughs> the other things where I'm like, I totally lost that. I, I, I was out, I, I dis, like disassociated, disconnected was thinking about my to-do list and no idea what he's talking about, but everyone's like smiling and nodding and thinking, okay, I just missed it. Or I'm not smart enough only to find out years later that most people felt, felt the same way. That wow. there was that, that he and and word salad now is actually a segment in our podcast where we look at different groups and we try to find some bullshit quote from the leader and my husband Nippy who does great impressions reads it aloud and we laugh at how ridiculous the the well the jargon the 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 slogans the the quotes from these leaders and everyone's like wow that is so profound but really like you're saying nothing. Oh my gosh. I love, I, I love it. I, I call people on word salads all the time, <laughs> especially, well, especially if- I'm sure you do. If you're a word warrior, I will say the main, one of the, one of the biggest red flags that we see now is these groups like to change language and they have their own right. words, their own dictionary. I mean, we, we had our own set of terms. There's hundreds of words that are English words, but are specific to what we did and have their own, um, but then we got weaponized, like Keith completely weaponized. Can I tell you a quick, so- a quick story? Yeah, please, please go for it. Um, and you might want to look this up because it's, it's pretty crazy. But one of the people who's still loyal to Keith recently went on a podcast, a really big podcast. I don't know if you know three, uh, H3, no, 3H. 
H3? Uh, no, I don't, I don't know um, that one, no. I'm embarrassed that I don't remember the name of the of it, but I've, my dyslexia has kicked in. Cedar 3, H3, H3 was a huge podcast. And he is just trying to get on any podcast that he can so he can talk about how Nexium cured his Tourette's and Keith is innocent and um, how the FBI planted evidence. Therefore, the whole trial should be kicked out and free, free Keith, essentially. And he didn't research this guy. Um, his name is Ethan Klein and he did, he, Ethan also has Tourette's and Ethan was like mm, so offended that, <laughs> that Mark is going around saying that he's like, his Tourette's was cured from Nexium. Anyway, all of this to say it was a big scan. This is happening right now. This is back and forth, this big scandal. And somebody wrote in his, the guy with Tourette's brother and, and said to Ethan that he was being dishonorable with the way he kind of, cause he kind of mocked this whole exchange and was laughing at him like, dude, like you're a brainwashed cult member. Like look at the trial transcripts, look at all the other allegations. Why would the FBI plant this evidence when there's all this proof? You know what I mean? And, and they were laughing wow. at him and this, his brother, and, and listen, I don't want to see anyone be laughed at, but it was also like a farce. I mean, it was a farce and his brother wrote in and said, you're being dishonorable. And the, the guy's like, what am I like? What are you a samurai? Like, but I knew what that meant because dishonorable was a really important word. Like you wanted to be an honor. The whole point was to be an honorable person. And if you spoke right. out negatively about anybody else, that was dishonorable. But hearing somebody go like, what are you, Sam? Right? Like I had this like secondhand <laughs> embarrassment for the 12 years that I used that word seriously. But as part of what we've learned in, in these groups is that it's, it's, there's a closed loop system of logic where um, the leader's protected. So in this case, Keith was protected by anyone talking shit about him because anything negative would be considered dishonorable. Right. So it, what, it, what was the term? Yeah. What was the term you guys used for someone that was let, that was that spoke negatively? There was a suppressive, a, a suppressive, yeah, yeah, yeah which yeah. is from Scientology, also by the way. Uh, yeah, it's, you know it's funny. So you were talking about the the take a test, and then twelve years later, I'm I'm getting branded mm -hmm. on a table. I had a, a, my only experience with, with groups like this was with Scientology, actually, where I took mm -hmm. an, I was like 19 uh, in Southern California in like the mid nineties. And I took one of these like, you know, like personality tests and I mailed it in. And then I got invited to this like free uh, like assessment. And I told you earlier, I'm a, I'm a self-improvement athlete. I, I was mm -hmm. like that when I was young and I show up and the, and, and, and I will say this, the guy that, that I met, I swear to God, I thought he was homeless. And, and he had like, he had like, he had like grime under his nails and he smelled like he was like, like he had like a weird, like he drank too much the day before smell, a smell pheromone to him. And I was like, uh, yeah, dude, I'm and he started doing a lot of the tactics that you describe in the book. But I was like, yeah, bro, you're scaring me. And I, and I left. Um, so it was, you reminded me of that when, when you just said what you said around this, uh, taking this assessment or this quiz or something. And all of a sudden, next thing you know, you're, you know, you're, you're deep in the rabbit hole. So no one, I think goes into this stuff, assuming it's going to happen to them. It just kind of happens. What do you, what do you think is, I, I mean, having been deep in one of these organizations, do you think that this was like early on the intention of the organization was to become what it became, or was this just like a slippery slope and it evolved over time? I think. The second thing you said is what happens in a lot of groups where the leader, and I see this a lot in like in the yoga world where there's a really well-intentioned teacher who just like the ego gets to their heads and then they're next thing you know, they're having sex with all the students and you know, nobody, nobody's calling them out. Right. That's very different. I think with Keith, he planned this from the beginning, what I've learned from wow. his inner circle. Yeah. Who's, who's since left and we're in touch that he look, he, I think he went to an, uh, an, an ashram in upstate New York. And he saw how the leader was idolized and was like, I want a piece of that. And he'd done other things. He'd other, he'd been, had other scams and he'd been in trouble with, with, um, the law. There was a court case that he, you know, he had a, a pyramid scheme that he got in a lot of trouble for. And there's, you could do a whole other episode on that. So I think when he saw that, he thought that that's my next gig. And he needed Nancy Selzman to be a legit coaching and goal setting facilitator to have, you know, a, a, le a legitimate, uh, seminar program that could lure people in. I a hundred percent believe from the beginning, he's like, I'm going to do this to get a fresh supply of young women and money. And just to, you know, keep my needs met from the beginning. 
Yeah, that's interesting. And what's also interesting is I think I, I recall in the book that you said that when you first met him, you described him. I mean, there's a few things that like stood out to me and I, I and it's been a couple of years since I saw the HBO series, but you, you described him as like a schlub and, <laughs> and it was, and that you, and there was like the three things that, that I, when I saw it, I, 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 I fucking cringed. A was like, yeah, he kind of looks like a schlub to your point when you first see him. And I think it was him on the volleyball court or something. Yeah. And then, and then the, like the playing volleyball and the lip kissing, like the mm. combination, I was like, what the fuck? It, like, yeah. <laughs> so what, like, was it, weren't those like, were you like, what, did you have a what the fuck moment? Oh I yeah. Mean, I, I mean, did. listen, there was, there was red flags from the beginning. And I think this is, I, I, I think this is clear in my book that I was very uncomfortable even from day one, but yeah, one of the brilliant things that they did is they, the gaslighting starts from the beginning and the gas right. so, so you're doubting your own experience. And they do that by saying like, when you're working on your shit and you're here to grow and you spent like, why well, I spent over $2,000 2005 for a, an actress living in a basement suite. $2,000 is a lot of money. And, and I was there to like get my money's worth and grow. And they're saying, you know, you're here, got to pay to play. You're going to feel uncomfortable. You're working on your shit. So if you're feeling uncomfortable, don't leave. I had an instinct to leave so many times but I have the voice in my head. Well, okay, I paid this money and I'm here to grow and successful people work on their shit, right? So here I am working on my shit. So from the beginning, we're overriding our internal compass, our, our intuition, right? So, and, so, so yes, when I said, and also the other thing is, is that they would say, if you're uncomfortable, it's going to point to something that you want to work on, which there's truth in that. Like the sashes, like there's this ranking system, like martial arts. I don't want to wear a sash. I thought that that was tacky. I thought it was like, cult. I mean, I wouldn't have used the word culty, but just weird, you know? And I, if you bring that up, then it's like, yeah, a lot of people have problems with the ranking because a lot of people have authority issues. Probably true. Probably people do have authority issues and they don't want to be in a room where someone's like, you know, like in the military, this is my, my superior. I'm superior in, to you in some way. So that's, there's, there's truth in that. So when I was uncomfortable with the kissing, like you just brought up, and I would say to someone like, why is he kissing everybody on the mouth? I'm like, well, you know, in Europe, people do it. People kiss on both cheeks. People kiss on the mouth in certain, I, I believe, Latin cultures. I don't want to get that wrong. But like that does happen in other places. And so this is a community where people are really close. It wasn't just Keith. Like we all did it. So it's it, at, in the end, right? So it's yeah. it became normalized. And I think that's what his goal was, was to normalize things that were a little bit, a little bit weird. And eventually it was normalized you know, polyamory. He had, you know, up to 15 to 20 spiritual wives at any given time. How, how did he, how did he back? The, so, so going back to that though, mm -hmm. that was actually my, my next question. Uh, first of all, I'm Persian, half Persian, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of lip kissing and mm -hmm. it was always weird for me. <laughs> <laughs> Even then. Yeah. And I'm in the culture. Yeah. So yeah, I yeah, grown men kissing young men. Like, yeah, dude, this is always, I mean, they're kissing each other. It's part mm -hmm. of the culture, but, but I was always, I mean, I remember being like, just cringing when my dad's friends would try to kiss me and like, Ooh, I was yeah. like 16. Um, yeah, but it's um, awkward. <laughs> I don't think I've ever admitted that on the podcast before. Um, so, so, <laughs> Something new from Darius. <laughs> it, it did happen. You know, the worst part about lip kissing uh, is when your dad and his buddies are drinking like scotch and eating uh, pickled garlic and then Ooh. they want to lip kiss. <laughs> so, yeah. story, story for another time. Um, yeah. But, um, but yeah, like, you know, what's interesting is that, like, as you're going, as you were there longer and longer, you know, one of the things that you mentioned was that he, they claimed that he was celibate, right? So right. how can you, well, no, he came so, up from the beginning. That was from the beginning. I was told that he was celibate. Right. So, so when yeah. all of a sudden, like, like, I can't imagine that, like, when was the first time you found out that he was sleeping with people? Was it seriously? After, at the, at, <laughs> well, no, that's how the, I, that's how I DOS? woke up. No, that's how I woke up. So then this is, this is the part of the book that you didn't get to where, where it gets like, it reads like a very intense thriller because everything happened very quickly. I was having doubts. I was trying to figure out how to get out of DOS, which is the secret women's group within the thing where I'd been branded. And I was, I knew things weren't good. And I, and I even said when it happened, like, guys, they think we're a cult already. And we're now like branding each other. I didn't know it was his initials. Finding out that it was his initials and finding out that other women were being invited to have sex with him, or they were given that assignment was how I found out about the sex. I didn't even find out till after we left about all of the women that he was having sex with, even before DOS. And that that's how it started. When he started, when he started Nexium, himself and the women around him were in a polyamorous relationship when Nexium began. Himself, 
Karen Unterreiner, who we had as a guest on our podcast, which is a fucking fascinating episode. Um, who else was there? Then Pam Kafritz and then Barbara Jeske. Like these were the the women in my, in my, that I talked about in my book that like the women that I looked up to. And I thought that they were like his team around him. I thought Pam was his assistant. Right. I thought that they were all working together to help him achieve his goals. Like they would drive him and like make him breakfast and stuff. I didn't realize they were his spiritual wives. And that was kept from us. It was kept from most people unless they were part of the inner circle and the inner circle was wow. the harem. So yeah, I didn't, I didn't know. And when I knew it was a whole other found out it was a whole other lo level of betrayal. Yeah. How did, how did, how did that feel for you? Like, like, I mean, uh, uh, that, <sighs> at this point, how many years were you into Nexium when you, when I was you stopped, 12, in for 12 years and at varying so, levels of, of commitment. But my, the height of my time there was like seven to 10 years in the last three years I was like pulling back. I'd had a baby. I was like kind of just putting in my time. <laughs> I never thought I was going to leave, but like I had other priorities at that time. Like I had, I had, a, I had a little kid. That's when they brought me into the, to DOS, I think to make, to lock down my loyalty. Uh, and we found out in the trial also potentially to be brought into the inner inner circle. Cause Keith had plans for me, which obviously never got to happen. Thank goodness. Um, but yeah, that was revealed in the trial that, uh, that's how we thought he'd get the married women. Oh, so he, yeah. so he was like, oh, I want like screw your, your, your husband, like who was also part of this group. He's like, I'm, yeah. I'm going to hook up with the married women too. Yeah. They're going to be part of my, my harem. Yep. And, and was he successful in that? No. Uh, outside? <laughs> oh, outside I mean, not of that? With, no, not with not you. With me. Sorry. No. Not, not with you. No. Not with you, but um, with, with, uh, with anyone else that you know of? Not that I, not with the name of the married women. I know he tried and that's where I feel like you know, he really derailed in terms of his understanding of reality and what was like <laughs> going to be okay. Like a lot of the things that we did were a bit, you know, they were weird and they were like, okay, we wear sashes and we take, you know, take off our shoes when you go into a seminar and a lot of people are, you know, counting calories in an extreme way. And it was extreme, you know, it was an extreme form of personal growth, but like this really took things too far. And then for him to think that he would be able to brand the married women with his initials and like somebody wasn't going to go ape shit on him. Like the fact that one of the husbands didn't go beat his ass before he got put in prison is a, mir it's a miracle for him. That, that was, that was actually where my head went. Cause I was like, if that was my, if that happened to my wife, I'd beat the fucking shit out of that. Oh dude. yeah. Listen, like, if Nippy was I, here, I would, I'd he probably, would tell you how much he wanted yeah. to. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, yeah. I, I mean, like I, I, I might be devious about it. I might hire someone like, like a Russian mobster or something <laughs> to do it, but that motherfucker would have a baseball bat. I'd break his fucking legs without question. You know so, what? Yeah, like, if Nippy like, was here your... and I could go get him and he's downstairs, but he would tell you like, <laughs> How, I mean, he still fantasizes about it. Like at seven years out, he still fantasizes about it. He knew that if he did that, that, that yeah. like he, you know, he's got a, a wife and a, at that time, three-year-old, my son's almost nine now. And that would have been really bad for everybody. And it wouldn't have really, you know, it's karma's karma works out like 120 years in prison and five years probation. It's probably better for him. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. Look, look you know what yeah, I mean? to your point, it's more, more of like vengeance is sweet. Yes. Know, for, but, but at the same time, it's like you, he, your husband has a lot to lose. Right. So like this guy got his, yeah. um, what, um, so, so as you, you know, were, it sounds like they were like trying to your point, solidify your loyalty. Yes. Um, you, you found out about, uh, what, what year, how much was that year 12 when, when the branding ceremony took place? Yes. And I left very shortly after. Very okay, so so you're twelve, you're twelve years deep. You find out about the betrayal, and then you're like, "Dude, I'm out. Like, this is fucking insanity." Like, what? How did that yeah. feel for you? It was. I mean, it's there's so many things. Um, one is that you know I was a, and I'm not saying this in a proud way. It's something I have to own. But I was a top recruiter. I was, I was one of the number one enrollers, not recruiters, what we called it. Um. And speaking of words, by the way, Keith said enrollment is building humanity, synonymous. I'm just mm. building humanity, right? Mm. So I'd done that for so long. I'd vouched for him. I'd vouched for this community. And to find out that not only it was a, you know, bad and nefarious, it was like the complete opposite of what I had said it was. So that's a real mind fuck, you know, that's uh, in, in this space, it's called a moral injury. It's like when a, a soldier 
finds out they've been a part of a war that wasn't actually for the reasons that they they thought they were going to war right. and that can really really can fuck with you and it did and so there's this, and then there's shame. And then there's like, you know, every person who's ever said like, it's a bit weird, or you might be in a cult. And I'm like, you don't understand. It's not a cult. And like, then you, I know that you talk about your network all the time on your, on your podcast. I had a huge network. That's one of the reasons why I was able to be such a good recruiter is because I tap my network and I'm, I'm a good salesperson. And so I burnt my fucking amazing network with spouting this shit. Like that's, it's like, imagine, imagine that you use your whole podcast to like spread the good word of all this stuff. And then you find out that you did the opposite and you hurt a bunch yeah. of people in the process. Yeah. Like it's devastating. And, um, I mean, we, we motivated very quickly, um, you know, got the troops organized to tell everybody what, you know, what had happened to me and get people out as quickly as we could. Um, that happened really fast, but the betrayal and like the, ang you know, these are people that came to my wedding, you know, these are people who were, yeah. um, our son's godmother. And I don't, I, I've, a lot of those people I've since forgiven, um, because I know that they were part of the, you know, the indoctrination, like no one, no one signed up to be a part of that. Um, everyone who's awake and has apologized, like welcomed them back with open arms. The people who still think that Keith is good and branding is the best way to build a woman's self-esteem. No, no, that's there. I'm, I'm waiting for them to wake up and I hope that they do. What, what percent, yeah. so what percentage of the group, if you, you know, like uh, at the higher upper levels are still like Keith supporters. Versus oh, it's a very people... small percentage. It's like Got it. less than 1% probably. I'm just doing the math in my head. Got uh, And this yeah, is not of the that. entire group. This is of the upper group. You're saying like, I mean, a few people, let me tell, let me tell you the numbers that I know. And you can tell me what you think. Okay. In the in the twenty years it was in existence, seventeen thousand people went through okay. the training. At any given Vanguard week, which was his summer retreat where everyone came to like pay respect and live our best lives for ten days in the up, upstate New York, there was never more than three hundred fifty to four hundred people. So at any given time, I'd say there were four hundred active people in terms of upper ranks and people that would like stop their summer to go celebrate with him. Okay. And so when we left, I would say the max of active people would be about a thousand of those 17,000. Okay. That's, that's, I mean, that's an, I don't have a list and anywhere between 400 to a thousand people max Yeah. that we were like, okay, we're all going. Everyone else was like, I, I took that training 10 years ago. Like I don't, I'm sure. not involved. Right. It's just a training. People come and go, but in terms of active community members, I'd say max a thousand and then okay. say there's less than 20 left. So not oh, many, not many people. There still are twenty people active that, that are like, active members that I know of. Yeah, and and wow. only maybe five to ten that are public about it. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And, and, yeah, and you kind of, I, I think you kind of answered one of my questions. Was you know, I, I was one of my questions was if, if there was no such thing as Keith Ranieri. I don't know if I pronounced his last name proper or not, but do you believe that his follow, followers would have ended up in another group or or being caught? up in, or were they just being caught up in the moment or this guy was so fucking like devious that he, he could turn like, do you think that there's a susceptibility to what, to, to, to members and their ability to become like a follower of his, or do you think that this is just his masterminding that, that, that got it to happen or a combination? For some reason, I didn't follow that question. Can you ask it again? Well, so, yeah. so you have these core group of people that mm -hmm. were avidly like supporters of his, right? Yes. And my, my question was, do you think that, 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 that this was all by his design that he took people that were great people, good people that, and got them to follow him? Or, or, or do you think there was just the, there's followers in there too? Cause you clearly were not a follower. Like you were someone that fought this thing right away. Mm -hmm. Um, you, and, but there in seems other words, like there was, yeah. Are you asking like, why, time. like, why don't they leave or, or like no. what makes somebody stay or what makes somebody follow or. Yeah. What, what yeah. I'm asking is, do you think that there's a certain type of person that is more susceptible to this type of group? Oh yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Um, yes and no. I've talked to a lot of experts about this. This is like a big question and there's a consistent answer amongst all the experts. And we have had pretty much every cult expert that I've, maybe there's a handful I haven't been able to get on the podcast yet, but almost everyone says the same thing which is that it can happen to anybody. It's not a particular type of mm. person per se. And there's certainly when I got out, it was like, 
you know, naive, vulnerable, weak-minded, stupid, um, flawed, broken, you know, things like that. And certainly that can happen. I think mostly from what I've seen is that it's more of a situational thing is that a certain type of person, uh, isn't exactly the right words. It's more like when in your life, like when you're at a crossroads or like you're looking for something or you're just, you're in between jobs and you're trying to figure out what's next and, or you're, you know, depressed or you're low or you're, you know, had a divorce or whatever the thing is. And the, the, the right person at that time that you trust says, Hey, like we're having a dinner party. It's not like, Hey, join my cult. It's like, you know, we're going to go play golf. <laughs> And then you're, that's the first step to, and we're, we're going to this meeting afterwards, or we're going to, um, you know, having a Bible study or whatever the, the, the next step is to, to bring people in. And I think that there's people who are naturally skeptical and there's always people that say oh, that will never happen to me. And that maybe that's very possible. Maybe that would never happen to someone who'd already been like, I don't think it would happen to me again. That's sure. possibly true. Um, I, I definitely tried to recruit people and they were like, I used to be a Jehovah's Witness. And so I, I, I know you're not a Jehovah's Witness, but it feels similar. And I'm like, oh no, we're not a Jehovah's Witness. Like you're just projecting. But like now since I've studied Jehovah's Witness, it's like a very similar structure. So wow. that experience saved that person, you know, that kind of thing. But people who say it never happened to them, I think they're the most susceptible because they don't take the time to educate themselves about how these things happen. And yeah, the red flags aren't going to be as clear because you're just like, oh, I'm too smart for that. And the thing that happens the most, uh, which I think is just hilarious and not hilarious is that people always either. And now I think it's changed a bit because there's so much cult education and podcasts and series and things out there where people are in things like the vow, which I think really was a big service for, for cult survivors and, and people who've been through situations and abuse survivors in general is that people said to me, I didn't see it before, but now I can see how that could have happened. And I could see how mm. that would have happened to me. And I would have signed up for that actually. And that's good because now, and I get letters about this daily, people writing to me saying, I got invited to this thing. And because of the vow or because of your podcast, the book or whatever, I was able to see this red flag. And I said, no, thank you. Like that's a huge win for me that we can educate people in that way. But the funniest thing I was going to say, I, I tangented is that people say, um, not the people who understand, but the other people are like, oh, yeah, I'm so sorry that happened to you. That wouldn't happen to me because, you know, I'm too skeptical or whatever. And then they they say something that they're a part of, and I'm like, dude, that's totally a cult. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, like, but, but, that, but a landmark forms the best. It's like, <laughs> don't get me started. Honestly, <laughs> in my opinion, landmark and Nexium are the exact same structure minus well, the branding. Yeah, it's funny that the, 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 um, as I mean, I know a little bit about Landmark, and I have some friends who are part of uh, what was it called? Est before that. Yeah. Um, and and um, the the biggest part of it that I see overlap is NLP, right? And yeah. that you guys leveraged NLP. You know, I wrote NLP. weaponized NLP. Right? Yeah, and the other structure, and I see this not just with Landmark, but all the what's called LGATs, large group awareness trainings, uh, is that ultimately they want to give you enough that you get like a high, like you feel elevated, and it's that rah rah kind of Tony Robbins like woo amazing. And at the same time, pinpoint the thing that's wrong with you, the thing, the area that you're broken and you need to fix, and then present that this is the only path to fix it. Mm. And that's a lie. What? That's not true. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Right. No, no, of course. Yeah. So look, yeah. I have a question for you mm -hmm. um, because you, you brought this up really early in the show and you didn't name the name, but, but um, what the bleep, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's Dr. Joe Dispenza, right? Yeah. Uh, he, uh, he was interviewed. It wasn't, it wasn't his thing, but he was interviewed. Yeah, mm -hmm. like, like I actually never heard of him till this summer, and then I read a couple of his books and mm -hmm. and actually did some of his meditations, and actually they were pretty helpful. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think about? Are you, do you have an, a, an opinion on him and his work? I haven't done a deep dive on him, but it's I would say about him what I would say about every all these other people in that space is like read the book, take the meditations, use the tools, and put them in your life. But if you go like study with him and like become a devotee of him and drop your podcast in your life and make his work, your life's work and make it your life versus putting the tools in your life, that's when it's a problem. And that's a very clear distinction. Yeah. Yeah, Does that make sense? That's really good. Good advice. Yeah. Totally I think, makes good sense. Yeah. I, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so, and I brought it up before the show, but, um, you know, I was funny in researching 
your your life and 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 I think there's a for most folks they saw that that you were a great recruiter a, a enroller excuse me mm-hmm. and and there was this whole element of Hollywood actresses that were coming into Nexium and from my understanding and when I did research on you it was like well you were a working a- actor during this time like you were doing a lot of work it seemed like your work actually picked up the the longer you were in Nexium mm-hmm. um, what like tell us a little bit about that because obviously you had this one world where you're an actor and you have this other world where you're in this like you know hardcore group like how did those two coexist it was bizarre actually I mean originally it helped me with my acting and it helped me get over my nerves and auditions. It helped me leave my not so great agent and get a new agent. Like that was an emotional limitation that I used the tools to overcome so I could break up with one and start a relationship with another one, which is hard. Like that, those are things in business, the business side of acting that I really found those tools helpful for. And I've since learned that's not ESP or Nexium. It's just like business 101 you know, how to have the hard conversations and scripting those things in a way that's not going to basically not navigating your, your emotional challenges around those things. Right. And, and sales, uh, those were things that were like super helpful in the beginning. Um, oh shoot. I just totally had a brain glitch. What did you just ask me? What was this? Oh no. <laughs> so I was asking about, yeah, yeah, no worries. It's, it's yeah. all good. I'm asking you a lot of questions. I did so warn my you question that was, I was like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Damn you, sleep. Yes. Um, no. Uh, go. Uh, the the question was like you were you ha- you had this successful oh uh, acting. acting career right, coexisting right, right. Yes. with Nexium. Thank like, you. Yeah. So so I'd, I'd love to. Yeah, yes. So back on track. There you go. So that was actually part of how I was able to to sell and recruit so um, smoothly is because I was able to say these tools helped me in my acting career. And because I knew so many actors and I was legitimately booking more and more successful and things like that, it was, it was, it just grew the community very quickly. That's why our community in Vancouver was largely actors because you, you bring people in that, you know, and I knew actors and I brought in more actors and so forth. And ultimately it changed over time. There was, there was a, probably in the height of it when things were great in Nexium. I had did a film that got in Toronto film festival TIFF, which is if you're in the, that world is like really ex- like sort of the height of the pinnacle of, of success in Canada, at least is like to be in a, a film at TIFF and I was making money. And I, I was a real advocate for the curriculum because I said the proof was in the pudding. Like, look at me in my life. I'm, I went from a basement suite to a condo on the water you know, I'm acting. It's, I have a voiceover career now. That voiceover was very, very lucrative. And I was able to use the tools to break into that industry, which I, I still do. Um, and then there came a time where I, it was a conflict, like to be a leader in Nexium and also to be um, an actor was, was difficult. I could, I was having a hard time doing, doing it, doing both of that, both of those things. And they would say things like, well, what's more important? you know, building humanity or doing Hallmark. And I'd have to say, well, of course, building humanity is more important than doing a Hallmark movie. Um, that kind of thing. So it, it, I started to, it started to, I started to say no to acting much to the chagrin of my agent. Um, I never let go of voiceover, which was very smart of me because when things ended, I had a career to go back to. And ironically also I started doing Hallmark movies again. It's like they, they just sort of picked me back up and I, and I went right back to it. I, I, did, I have stopped since then um, having another child and COVID and whatnot, but maybe I'll get back to it eventually. Yeah. Like I, I, uh, going back to what I said a second ago, I was like, I could, I, like, I'm so fascinated by, by your story. Mm-hmm. And this is, uh, this is, I mean, there's a reason why there's like, uh, like how many episodes is of the vow is it like 16 episodes or something like that, 20 episodes. I think there's nine um, and then in the first season and then six in the second. And we have yeah, so I think 86 <laughs> podcasts so far. And a little bit yeah so, so there's like uh, lots of content know, a few hundred hours of content right so there's mm-hmm. the we could the, the, like we're not going to get through uh, all of it here on the greatness machine but um mm-hmm. you know look obviously you 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 kudos to you and to your husband and and i know that mark and all you guys like did what you had to do to take down nexium and i know there's a lot of people involved in that um and kudos to you for like really transitioning into this new role. I'd, lo- I'd love for you to talk a little bit about the podcast because you've mentioned it a little bit throughout the show, but that's a big deal. And you guys are kicking ass with that. I'd love for you <laughs> to talk about it and teach us a little bit about what's going on there. Oh, thank you. I, and I appreciate those kind words. You know, 
when we left, we didn't, we, this was not the plan. This look, it was really just, we have to get out and save our family. And then we realized we had to save everybody that we could. And we, we were successful minus 10 or 20 people. Um, and then, you know, the vow was, we were filming not to make an HBO docu-series. We were filming to document what was happening, mostly to protect ourselves in case they tried to come after us, which they did. And, um, I had no idea that that footage would turn into the vow, which came out during COVID. And that was wild because we're all, you know, at home and then this, you know, there's the tiger King and then there's the vow and my life blew up. And what was really interesting about that. And Nippy and I talk about this all the time is that we were in such darkness, like that, you know, Keith is a fucking evil person. He's, he's next level evil. And there's so many people like that that are coming out in various docu-series. Like this is all being unearthed right now. It's not just Keith. But then when we got out, so many incredible people crossed our paths. And one of them was somebody who reached out and said, um, I'm ex-evangelical Christian, and we make podcasts from Citizens of Sound. And they said, you should make a podcast. And we're like, really? But like, isn't the vow kind of cover it? And I'd also written the book. And they, and I said, I put it on my Instagram. I said, who here would want to know more in a podcast? And like one of those polls and Everybody except for one person said, yes, yes, yes. But that one person was my assistant. And, and I said, why don't you think I should do a podcast? He's like, you were so busy. Like, when are you going to have time to do a podcast? And she's, she's, she's right. I, like, I tell her often, you were right. This is a lot of work, but I love it. Um, and then we met, uh, somebody messaged me on LinkedIn, um, who had, a, who was part of a, an ad agency and it was an incredible writer. And she's like, you should do it. You should call it a little bit culty. And she pitched it to us and she's our producer and now our best friend, Jess Tardy. And, um, it, it just, it grew out of like, you know, two simple mics in our living room to our full-time career. And we've been able to interview the most incredible guests, experts, survivors, advocates, whistleblowers, and people who are like, not only really, I'm going to get emotional, <laughs> um, That's really changing things about. in this space, but people who are you know, were real, um, pace cars for Nippy and I, like Mike Rinder and Leah Remini from Scientology in the aftermath and, uh, Evan Rachel Wood, who has been an advocate for women and exposing what happened with Marilyn Manson, her ex yeah. and, um, talking to spiritual leaders who might be a little bit culty, but are also just spiritual like Eckhart Tolle. And to be able to have those conversations on our podcast, um, is, like ironically the meaning that I was looking for 17 years ago. So I wasn't expecting this. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no worries, man. Was, I, I appreciate the vulnerability yeah. and, and it's, I didn't, I didn't, I don't ever try to take people there, but you know, <laughs> well, I, I think that the fatigue helps me, but when I really settle into what that means and what we get to do and yeah. um, that we get to help people in a way that I thought I was helping people. And, um, I mean, it truly is very fulfilling. That's why I'm not really acting right now. I don't feel the need. I don't feel the need to act uh, because I, my life is so full and rich and we have, we have two kids and we get to, I mean, yesterday I was, at, I came out into my yoga studio and this woman stopped. She's like, oh my God. And I knew when I heard you're moving to Atlanta that I would meet you and told me her story and she was in tears and we hugged and it happens almost daily that someone's seen the vow or listened to the podcast and our story has helped them to get out of something, whether it's a culty church or Mormonism or, um, an MLM or some, or an abusive relationship. And to know that like, we're just having these conversations and it's in people's ears and it's helping them is, you know, I can't, I can't ask for anything more than that. Truly. I love, I love it. That's, uh, I'm so excited for, for <laughs> all the work you guys are doing. Oh, um, thank you. I want to respect your time. I, I've, we, we like to end every, every show with, with the same question. So I'd love to ask you this question sure. and then we'll get wrapped up and we can kind of let people know all the different ways they can connect with all the work you're doing. Does that, does that work for you? Yeah. Great. Cool. So, um, you know, here at the greatness machine, like I mentioned, we're all about people living their passions to create greatness in the world. So, um, this is, I mean, I feel actually this is the first time I'm asking this question where I'm like, I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> You've kind of answered it already, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Sure. What is the number one, what is the number one barrier to creating greatness in the world that you've overcome in your life and how did you overcome it? I think I overcame it by facing some real adversity and I don't think I ever really had before that. And 
ironically, Keith used to say that character is not character until it's tested. You can just talk about the kind of person that you are, but I got to figure out like really what I'm made of and what my true character is. And I'd say it's because of that. I love that. Um, I have a favorite saying, which is fuck that guy. And that's how I feel about <laughs> Keith. Just so we're, just so we're on the same page. Absolutely. Um, fuck <laughs> that guy. We have a segment in oh, a little bit culty called that chaps my ass. Where we talk about things that, that chat my ass about different, different groups, different cults. And, um, yeah, it's the whole, the whole system is chaps my ass. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, when you're, when your character was tested, you took that motherfucker down. So yes. good for you. <laughs> bad on him. Um, well, gosh, Sarah, much, so much fun. Such so a much amazing fun. episode. Thank you so you're, much for having me. You're such a good guest. Um, I, I'd love for you to, you know, let our and listeners know, like, how can they, you know, learn more about your stuff? Just give them the download of where they can connect with you and your work. Thank you. Uh, if they want my full story, I'd love for people to, to buy or listen to the book. Um, it's on audible and I narrated it. So I got to put my voiceover skills to use, which is cool. Um, uh, the vow obviously on HBO, but I think our biggest baby, our biggest project is a little bit culty and they can find it wherever you listen to podcasts. We're also on Patreon where we do live zooms, uh, Q and a with our guests afterwards. So people can, can listen and we send them a care package with a, hold on, I'm going to show you stay right there. We send them, um, a little bit culty hats and presents and, um, should have been wearing this and, uh, yeah, Instagram, I'm rarely on Twitter, but I think Instagram is also a good way to get a hold of me at Sarah Edmondson or at a little bit culty. Cool. You guys, you heard it here uh, a little bit culty is the podcast, the book, which I I'm halfway through. It's an awesome book scarred check it out. I'm going to finish it this week and, um, yeah, go, go follow Sarah and all the work she's doing. So Sarah, um, such so much gratitude for me having you come on the show so grateful to get to hear your story and learn about all the amazing things that, that you've been through and that you've overcome and the work you're doing and yeah we really appreciate having you here thank you so much for having me it was really fun you asked great questions and i look forward to uh sharing it when it comes out awesome guys uh, please uh as leaders we're sharers and givers uh share this episode. Everyone needs to hear this. Uh, go get the book, go listen to the podcast. And with that said, peace out. We love you guys. You are listening to the greatness machine and that's a wrap for today. Listen, if you love what you heard, subscribe to the show on whatever podcast platform that you're tuning in on so that you don't miss any of our future episodes. We have tons of great people coming on and we're, we're stoked to have you here to enjoy it with us leave us a review. Tell us what you love most about this particular episode. We love getting the reviews. We love to see what you guys love most. And if this particular episode, you know, made you think of someone who's leveling up in their business and in their life, print screen, share it with them. Leaders are the best givers. And after all, we're all here to support and grow with each other. And in case you want to see some of the fun behind the scenes shots or some of the things that we're doing, I'm actually writing about this in my weekly newsletter. Go to www.therealdarius.com and subscribe to my newsletter. We're talking about fun things like business and life and mindfulness and cryptocurrencies and gosh, I don't even know everything and anything, but it's tons of fun stuff I write about. I try to get it out on a weekly basis. You can subscribe at www.therealdarius.com. And with that said, look, thank you guys so much. I appreciate you. I love you. Peace. We're out of here. See you guys on the next one. Uh -huh. She's my lover.